Thanks for everyone for sticking around and for those who are joining us. Um, once again, if you're just joining us, please feel free to utilize the chat function um, and tell people who you are, where you're from, what work you do, um, and please direct all Q&A questions you have for Dr. Emily Fairfax into the Q&A function, um, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, it is now my absolute pleasure to announce um, Dr. or introduce Dr. Emily Fairfax, who is assistant professor of physical geography in the Department of Geography, Environment, and Society at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. She is also affiliated with the St. Anthony Falls Laboratory at the University of Minnesota. Her current research focuses on the underhydrology of riparian areas, particularly those who have been impacted by beaver damming. So with that, um, I'd like to hand it off to Emily Fairfax and yeah. Um, thank you. All right, so I'm hoping you can all hear me all right. And if you can, I'll watch the chat for those angry messages. Um, I'm gonna be talking to you today about beavers in the Midwest, specifically those ecosystem services that they provide and what that means in the context of climate change and climate resilience. So I wanna start off by just taking a small step back, right? Climate's changing. That's the whole crux of my talk. Climate's changing and beavers can help us. I don't think I really need to be convincing anyone here of that specifically, but I will say we are feeling the effects of this today and there's a lot more coming on the horizon. This map I'm showing you here on the slide is our seasonal drought outlook. <clears throat> and the colors that you should worry about are the brown. Uh, and if you look at the Midwest, there's a lot of brown and beige. And that means that we have drought persisting and in some cases not even improving as we go into the fall. So it's drier than normal. It's weather that we're not expecting and we're not used to out here. This is a historically quite a soggy place, but it's getting hotter, it's getting drier. We're seeing the impacts of that. And looking forward, that hotness, that dryness, it's creating a lot of fire risk, which is also something we haven't had to think about in the Midwest a lot. I grew up in the Midwest and I cannot remember a single time I even thought about a drought or wildfire growing up. And now moving back here, looking at the fire outlook, I'm like, seriously, the big hot spot of wildfire risk this fall is the Midwest. It's Minnesota, it's Wisconsin, it's Illinois, it's Iowa. It's states that have a lot of vegetation and states that are drying out. We desperately need to build more climate resilient landscapes. We cannot have our boreal and subboreal forests, our grasslands, our prairies go up in smoke. We cannot watch as the water level drops lower and lower and lower in our lakes, our ponds, and our reservoirs. And we cannot tolerate our cities, our communities, our neighborhoods being consumed by massive flood waves. This is our future though, if we don't build more climate resilient landscapes. This is what climate change has brought us and is bringing more to us every single day, every single year. So we need to engineer something. We need to figure out a better solution. And what I wanna ask everyone to consider is what about nature's engineers? Instead of engineering all these solutions ourselves, instead of trying to come up with contraptions that might solve these problems in the short term, how can we partner with nature's engineers to solve these problems in a long-term and sustainable way? And yes, I am talking about the beaver, as I hope everybody on this summit would know by both the picture and the theme of the summit. So beavers and climate change, this is not peanut butter and jelly for a lot of folks. This is not something that maybe you've thought about a lot together. Maybe you've considered beavers on their own and considered climate change on its own. But the point of my talk today is to really illuminate how these two concepts are really closely connected and how we can lean on those connections to have a more sustainable and a brighter future in the face of this grand challenge that is climate change. So beavers are nature's engineers. I'm showing you a pretty classic beaver dammed landscape. This one's from up in northern Minnesota. You've got the beaver dam, lots of vegetation around it. When you're closer to the pond and the water, you have shorter, more herbaceous wetland type vegetation. You get further out, there's trees. But how does this come to be? How do beavers turn any other type of system into these wetlands? Well, a lot of our waterways actually look something like this, the little drawing at the bottom corner of my slide. They are simplified. They are degraded. What used to be more complex streams and rivers have simplified into these single thread channels uh, that actually can't support a whole lot of ecosystem around them. They're disconnecting from their floodplains. They are ultimately in a very degraded state. About half of the waters, the surface waters in the Midwest are degraded. And as such, they are not able to sustain the ecosystems that have historically depended on them. But that doesn't stop beavers, thankfully. Beavers see a stream like this and they think that they can still make it their home. So the first thing they do is build a dam. That dam is made of sticks and stones and mud. 
it is a permeable leaky structure. Water flows through it, water flows around it, water flows under and over it, but it does slow it down. It's not stopping the water, but it's definitely slowing it down. And so what this dam does as it slows the water down is it starts to reconnect that waterway to its floodplain. It starts to allow water to flow out into the soils to rebuild and rewater all of those riparian or creekside plants and to start to develop a little bit more of a wetland ecosystem in what was previously degraded and dried out. Beavers don't stop there though. The phrase busy as a beaver has real ecological foundation. They keep working on this. Beavers are gonna expand that dam. They're gonna to wanna to make it longer. They're gonna make it stronger, taller. They wanna hold back even more water. The whole reason that beavers are doing this is because when they're in the water, they're incredibly safe. Beavers are a semi-aquatic rodent that weighs anywhere from 40 to 100 pounds. They have a body shaped like a bowling ball, webbed back feet, little raccoon type hands, and this huge paddle tail coming off the back end. Now, when beavers walk across the landscape, walk really isn't the right word for it. It's more of a waddle. They're very, very vulnerable to predators. Uh, wolves can easily hunt beavers when they're out of the water. So all of this construction work the beaver's doing is really just to make itself have a larger safe area to live in. It wants a bigger pond and that's good for the beaver. But that also has this ripple effect out into the rest of the floodplain, out into the rest of your riverscape, and it starts to broaden and create this huge expansive wetland. It's not just a little bitty pond, it's not just a little bitty stream, it's this complicated place that has a lot of different flow paths, it has a lot of different water storage mechanisms, and that's great for the beaver. But as beavers going around chewing on trees, building stuff, it starts to have to travel further and further to reach new materials. And instead of walking overland, where it's gonna be very vulnerable, or waddling overland, I should say, the beaver instead will dig canals. And this is a really underappreciated part of beaver landscape engineering. The canals that beavers dig radiate from their home ponds out into the rest of the landscape and fill with water. These are like little micro streams, which the beaver uses like a highway to jump in, swim around and be safe. It also floats back trees to its main pond to build with. But from a hydrologic perspective, these are functioning like irrigation lines. This is piping water out across your entire floodplain throughout your entire riverscape and rewetting it and reactivating it and redeveloping that ecosystem. And if you were to visit a beaver pond in the field, you'd see all of these things. You'd see the dam, that's the structure on the left-hand side of the image, holding back the water, slowing it down, but not stopping it. You'd see the beaver lodge. This is a separate structure. It looks like a dome of sticks that the beavers live inside of. You see beavers swimming around looking all agile and like they're good strong mammals and then you see the beavers sitting on the bank in the background looking like they're just kind of a big sphere of an animal uh, chewing on those trees but you have those canals snaking around. This is what we see in the Midwest. This is everywhere. What is sometimes a little bit harder to see is that top-down view and to just really appreciate how complex beaver engineering really is. It's not as simple as oh a beaver comes in it builds a dam. Oh the beaver has obstructed the flow of water. This aerial shot of a beaver complex is one that I took that I think is very representative of many of the beaver ponds I visited across North America. This is a hallmark of beaver ecosystem engineering. It's not a region specific behavior. You have the beaver building dams. There's several of them in this image, but then you also just have this incredible network of canals and they are not unidirectional. They don't only go out from the pond. They connect upstream to downstream. They connect pond to pond. They connect pond to hill slope. They create this incredible web of water that has transformed the entire floodplain into a wetland. And within that wetland, you have patches of fast water, patches of slow water, deep water, shallow water. It's truly a mosaic of habitat and water types. And that's what beaver engineering is. It's not just a dam and a stream. It's this whole suite of behaviors that creates this mosaic of habitat. And you don't really see that unless you're looking straight down. And I think that's a shame because the scale of work the beavers have done, a lot of it's hidden. This is a beaver pond in Wisconsin uh, that looking at it, you can see the dam, you can see some vegetation. There's a little dam getting built in the background as well. You might be able to discern it starting to cross the stream there, but you don't see that complexity unless you're truly looking straight down on top of it. You don't see the connectivity. You don't see the whole picture of the beaver pond. And so one of the things I want to really emphasize in my talk today is what that whole picture is. What are beavers doing beyond just a dam and a stream? What are the whole suite of services that their engineering is providing? Now, whenever I talk about beavers, uh, I get asked a lot of questions about them. So I wanna head off a couple of those questions. First of all, are beavers stopping all the water? Are they starving the downstream areas of water? And are they making floods worse? 
I showed all these beautiful ponds. I showed this really wet floodplain. Uh, I was intentionally avoiding saying beavers are flooding the whole floodplain uh, because the word flood has such a negative connotation, not because it's not true. Beavers are flooding a lot of things, but are they making floods worse? I wanna preface my answers to that with a little bit of information about where we're going uh, with rain and snow in the Midwest. Across North America, a lot of the continent is very dependent on snowmelt. We think about snowmelt a lot with the American West. We think about, oh yeah, the mountains, they have that big snowpack and all the water in the West is coming from snowpack. But here where I'm in Minnesota and throughout the Midwest, we also get quite a bit of snow. And when that snow melts, it's a large portion of our water. This map is color coded by how much of our runoff in our rivers and streams is coming from snowmelt. And if you're anywhere in the shades of blue, then it's half or more of the stream flow is coming from snowmelt. As climate changes, we're expecting to see wetter winters and drier summers. So overall, the Midwest is supposed to get wetter, which is a relief compared to places that are getting way too dry. However, the timing is not uniform. We get more water, more precipitation in the winter, more snow sometimes, not always, um, and then these really dry summers. So figuring out how to keep our hydrologic system balanced is going to be important as we think about adapting to climate change up here. We're getting hotter. We're actually having less snowy days in the upper Midwest, particularly, despite having more precipitation. And we're expecting a significant increase in heavy precipitation and flood events. So there's going to be a lot of water in this system, um, but it doesn't mean we're going to have a lot of water in summer. We're going to have a lot of water in winter. When beavers move in, they really have a strong influence on the timing of water. I'm showing you here a stream that does not have beavers, a conceptual model of one. And we're looking top down on it. It's simple, there's a very narrow band of vegetation around its banks. We've all seen something like this. Now here's the beaver dam stream. So this stream, as I showed before, it's complicated. There's canals, there's a dam, there's a lot more vegetation going on here. When we have a flood event, when we have one of those big precipitation events, we have a rainy winter or a very snowy winter, a lot of times we get flood waves. Anyone who visited the Mississippi this spring saw flood waves. We had some pretty serious high water. Those flood waves, when they propagate down these simplified systems, they don't have the capacity to carry that much water. And so the flood wave is powerful and it starts to rip apart our streams. It rips apart our rivers. It destroys the banks. It pulls vegetation out and it just scours. But if you have your flood wave enter into a wetland or a patch of wetland, it doesn't have to be all wetlands. Rivers can also just be rivers, but they should have wetlands on them because what happens when it hits a wetland patch is the flood wave encounters deeper water, it encounters wider water, and it can start to spread out and slow down, find these alternate flow paths, reconnect with the floodplain, get stored in the floodplain, and ultimately, it still makes its way downstream. It's not starving downstream of water by any means, but it's coming through slower and it's coming through with less power. And when we talk about having these extreme rainfall events, that's too much power in the water. We need to take it down a notch. We're going to see damage to infrastructure. We could have our simple single thread channels where we get a lot of erosion, soil loss, and scouring. Or we can have these beaver engineered wetland patches where instead we see water being spread and stored and slowed. To me, this feels like a somewhat obvious choice, right? We don't want that water to go cascading downstream and be gone in summer and do a bunch of damage on its way. We want to have the ability to access it, to use it, to use it for agriculture, to use it for recreation, for boating, for whatever people are interested in. We don't want that water to be gone at the wrong time of the year. And the water isn't gone. Um, I said a lot of it does still go downstream pretty shortly after the rainfall event, but some of it is being stored in those floodplain soils. Those canals are really effective at piping water out onto the floodplain where it can sink into the soil and be put onto these slower flow paths where it takes longer to get downstream. It's now moving through the shallow groundwater system instead of through our surface water system. I'm showing you now a cut with depth into the earth of that same stream without beavers and the stream with beavers. In both of these situations, I'm currently showing you a wet period. So we have infiltrating precipitation, there's rain or snow melt or something coming onto the surface of the land. All of the plants are able to access water via their roots. Our stream has a relatively small impact on the groundwater system when it's degraded. The beaver pond and all of those channels or canals that they dig have a much broader impact. There's a lot more water storage happening. And I've put us with a somewhat deep water table. So this is meant to be in summertime when our water table starts to drop down or in places where there's been excessive groundwater extraction, which is happening actually quite a bit uh, on the north side of Wisconsin and Minnesota uh, in particular. 
But as long as we have rain or snow, like the plants don't care. They're getting their water from somewhere. They're green, they're happy, they're healthy. It's when we lose that rain. It's when we enter these drier summers that we're seeing um, right now, very dry summer, uh, and the increasingly dry summers that we're expecting in the coming decades, that the impact of the beaver really starts to shine. So once we enter drought conditions, all those plants can only thrive if they have access to water in the soil. And if there has not been water stored there, because when we had all the rain in winter, it just cruised downstream and was gone, those plants are now without water. They're going to start to wilt and wither, dry up, become crispy, become crinkly. Um, if you don't water your lawn, you probably saw this happen this year, the plants were struggling. But when we have the beavers doing their engineering, they've stored so much water during those wet periods. And they have such an effective connection with the floodplain soils because of all these canals that there's this huge sponge of soil beneath and around the beaver pond that is full of water. And those plant roots can keep tapping into that, keep drinking right out of it, even if it's not raining. And this is something that I've personally studied in the American West, but it's also something that was studied by Glennis Hood up in Canada in a boreal climate. And so this is not something that's region specific either. This is the fundamental physics of water and soil. When you have water in the soil and plant roots are touching it, they can drink it, they can use it. When your soil is dry, the plants cannot access water in it, it's dry. This happens across the board anytime we have a drought, which is happening more and more. And if I was gonna give you a match and ask you to drop the match in the landscape, you would probably feel safer dropping it in that beaver dammed landscape than in the landscape without beavers. And that's because we know intuitively that dry vegetation burns easily. We see it happen. We watch these dried up trees, these dried up herbs, these dried up grasses, they just go up in smoke at the smallest ignition event. A campfire, a match, a lightning strike, a power line, doesn't matter. If it's dry, it's gonna burn. When you have an area that's insulated against the effects of drought, like the beaver ponds are, you don't ever really get to that dry state where it's easy to burn. So you can drop matches in wetlands. I don't, I really don't recommend doing that. It's not an endorsement, um, but you could in theory, and it, it's very unlikely that you would start a fire because it's wet. Like you drop a match into a cup of water, it goes out. You drop a match into a great big soggy patch of earth, it goes out. This is what we hypothesized happened around beaver ponds. And then this is also what we saw happen around beaver ponds. When there were no beavers in this riverscape, and this is from Idaho in 2018 during the Sharps fire, Joe Eaton and his group photographed that a wildfire was able to come right on the hill slopes, burn the entire valley bottom, burn the river bottom, and go right up the other side unimpeded. But if there were beavers in the riverscape, the fire still came down the hill slope just the same, but once it reached the valley bottom, it was too wet to burn. This was a high severity fire. This was an intense area of burning. The fire comes down the hill slope, cannot burn the beaver ponds, stalls, and it's only when an ember can get blown all the way across that riverscape can it light the other hill slope and then go up the other side. So no, the beavers did not stop the fire here, but what they did do was create these pockets of habitat that were preserved during that fire. When we didn't have the beavers, in that image on the left, you can see these little white splotches along the banks of the river. That's where there used to be willows. That's where there used to be vegetation. There's nothing there anymore except a little pile of ash. But when there were beavers, the exact same fire, just a little bit upstream or downstream, didn't matter which direction you went, as long as there were beavers, you had a completely different scene. You had thriving willows, you had herbs, you had grasses, you had water, you had beavers, and you had a bunch of other animals able to access and use this habitat too. These were incredibly popular places for the fish to be during the fire, because if you're a fish, you certainly are not going to get out and run away. You have to find a deep, cold pool and try to hunker down and persist. And that's what we saw happen. And when I saw this, and when I was thinking about this, I couldn't help but wondering, is this something that happens everywhere? Is this something that's just an innate aspect of beaver engineering? Or is this really regional? Is this like, oh yeah, beavers in Idaho were very lucky. They didn't have their wetlands burn, but generally they would burn. So I wanted to test this. And to do that, I looked at five different wildfires in five different states. And at the time I thought these were really big wildfires. Uh, I don't think that anymore, but um, I'll come back to that. And what they had in common is that there was a lot of beaver activity within the fire perimeter. What they did not have in common was the slope, the dominant vegetation type, the intensities of all of these fires. Um, the spread of the fire, the timing of the fire, everything about the fires had a lot of variety, except there were beavers within there. And so my idea setting this up is like, okay, if 
in California, Colorado, Idaho, Wyoming, and Oregon, in these three really different fires, I continuously see these green patches around beaver wetlands, then I know that they are really capable of creating and maintaining those patches of what's called fire refugia, no matter what the fire condition is, no matter what kind of vegetation is in the upland area and the surrounding hill slopes, this is just a repeatable thing. So that's what I wanted to check. Are these beaver complexes staying green during wildfires? Now to do that, I want you to imagine that you walk along every single creek in all of my study areas from a designated starting point to a designated stopping point. And you're gonna do this for every single creek uh, the year before the fire and then right after the fire burns. As you walk along, you stay as close to the river as possible and you're taking notes about how green the plants are. Are they alive? Are they burnt? Uh, are they somewhere in between? Also take notes about if there are beaver dams, beaver canals, or other signs of beaver landscape engineering. This is basically what we did, except instead of actually going back in time and visiting fires that burned a decade ago, we used remote sensing to look back and assess the vegetation greenness before the fire and then after the fire by extracting pixel values of burn severity and NDVI, which is a measure of plant greenness. So I'm going to show you just a little bit of my data. This is from the Manter fire, which burned in the Domeland Wilderness of Sequoia National Forest. It burned back in 2000. It was 79,000 acres. This is home to one of the largest sprawling beaver complexes I found in uh, the Southern Sierra Nevada mountain range. The actual landscape that the beavers are on uh, is pretty sparsely vegetated. It's really just the rivers that have any kind of greenery. And yet, even with that lack of a lot of vegetation, it had a really severe wildfire. So this felt like a good example. And the more I was reading about this, uh, the more I realized that this fire was no joke. I came across this quote from the LA Times describing the Manter fire. It is a humbling expression of nature, walls of flame, 70 feet high, twice as high as the nearest tree. Left behind, quite literally, is scorched earth. So thinking about this quote and thinking about this fire and thinking about beavers, it didn't feel like the beavers were going to be able to maintain fire refugia through this. I am the first person to tell you that beavers are bigger than people expect. Like most people don't think that they're going to be, you know, 80 pounders waddling around out there, but there are. Uh, but beavers are not bigger than a 70 foot wall of flame. And something that is leaving behind quite literally scorched earth is a lot of power. And beavers have a lot of power too, but that is a completely different scale. So going into this study, I will admit I was not super confident in the beavers, but uh, the data is what's important, not what I was feeling going into it. So I'm going to show you the data. I'm going to show you my plant greenness data, and it's going to be plotted as the greenness on the y-axis. This is NDVI, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. A lower number means there's less or fewer green plants. Higher number means there's more green plants. And then our x-axis, that's the distance along the creek profile. So when you just started mapping, you were down there at zero. And then as you walk along the creek, you move along the x-axis. So your start point was zero. Your stop point is about 4,000 on this plot. Now, before the fire, it looked something like this. And if you don't work with NDVI on the daily, this probably doesn't mean a whole lot to you. What does an NDVI of 0.4 or 0.6 even mean? Uh, that's okay. I'm going to put a threshold onto this plot. This dashed yellow line now is the minimum healthy NDVI I would expect to see in a riparian zone or in a wetland during the growing season. And this is data from the growing season. Now you'll see most of it's above there. There's a couple little spots that it dips down and looking at these actual creeks in the actual physical setting here, those tend to be places that just don't have a lot of vegetation there. It's pretty rocky. But overall, we see the NDVI, it is above that threshold pretty significantly. Most of the time, NDVI caps out at one, and that's like you're in a jungle. So seeing an NDVI of 0.4 to 0.6 does indicate pretty lush vegetation. And then after the fire, the greenness looked a little bit different. So for a while there, it was pretty much on top of the before the fire curve. And then around 1,500, 1,600 meters or so along that x-axis, it really drops off and does not come back above the threshold for the entire remainder of the walk along the creek. Now overlaid with little black boxes on the x-axis are the positions of the beaver dams. And looking at where we have beaver dams, that coincides with where there's not a significant difference before the fire versus after the fire. The vegetation looks pretty much the same, it's unaffected. 
where we don't have beaver dams, that's where there's a big difference in these curves. That's where we see a significantly reduced condition of the vegetation post-fire, whereas it was perfectly happy and green and healthy before the fire. To make this difference even more clear, I've plotted the difference. And so now you're looking essentially at a measure of fire impact. So a higher number means there's more impact from the fire, there's more burning. A lower number means there's less impact from the fire, less burning. Same x-axis, same positions of the beaver dams, it's pretty significantly clear here that where there's beaver dams, there's a lot less fire impact. We are not seeing significant burning around the beaver ponds. And I didn't see this just once. I saw this in every single creek I studied in all of those fires. Putting the data together, I found that the beaver dammed areas experienced three times less burning than areas that didn't have any beaver activity. And this was great. I felt like I could kind of like crack it open and solve it. Like, yeah, okay, awesome. Beavers do create fire resilient patches, fire resistant patches. And this is really generalizable. I published this, I gave it a flashy title, Smokey the Beaver. And then uh, I saw this great photo of a black bear actually taking refuge in the beaver pond from my study, which sets me up um, to constantly make a joke that, you know, Smokey Bear got a little helping hand from Smokey the beaver. But more importantly, it highlighted to me that these patches are not just like a fun scientific project. These are a place that's being used routinely by wildlife during these incredible wildfire events for them to stay safe. This is a valuable patch for the beavers, but it's also valuable for the predators. It's valuable for the fish, the frogs, the herons, the toads, the snakes, everything else, the insects. These are the oasis amidst the fire. But we're in the age of megafires now. Even here in the Midwest, we are seeing fires that are extreme and that are well outside the natural fire regime uh, in terms of their behavior. So a megafire by definition is a fire that's larger than 100,000 acres. And just being big doesn't make a fire bad. Uh, we can have lots of fires that are huge, that are totally fine. They're good for that ecosystem. Most ecosystems in North America have evolved to need some amount of fire at some sort of frequency. But a lot of megafires are getting to be megafires because they are exhibiting really extreme self-sustaining behaviors. They actually create their own weather systems. One of the things you'll see in a megafire is it'll create what's called the pyrocumulus cloud. This is a cloud that looks like a thunderhead, but instead of rain coming down, it spews down ash and ember. And those start secondary fires, then merge with your primary fire, making it even larger, more powerful, hotter, and then it can create a pyrocumulonimbus cloud. These are sometimes called the fire-breathing dragons of clouds. If you have ever seen those viral news clips of a fire tornado, or what looks to be like a blizzard, but instead of it being snow, it's fire whipping across the screen, that's made by these pyrocumulonimbus clouds. These really extreme fires have explosive spread rates. They can go 100,000 acres in a day. This has been observed. This is really, really fast spread. This is hard to manage. And when it spreads that fast, it's usually spreading extremely hot. And that leaves behind these huge swaths of moderate and severe intensity burning. That tends to be more destructive. That tends to make it so that our ecosystems are not poised to rebound and regrow as they naturally would. Instead, they are significantly disturbed and in some cases destroyed. So I wanted to know if this effect, these fire refugia can persist around beaver ponds, even during extreme fire behavior. To answer that question, I decided to look at the uh, three megafires that burned in the Rocky Mountains in 2020. Now I chose these megafires because um, hopefully this resonates with some folks on this call. Colorado had never had to deal with megafires. It had been hundred plus years since they had their last one. And then 2020 rolls around and they have three going on at once, threatening to merge with one another that they were completely unprepared to deal with. They had no way to put these fires out except wait for the snow. Uh, and so I think that having also lived in Colorado in the past, Colorado probably should have taken more notes and learned from California that had been dealing with megafires for the last 25, 30 years. Now that Colorado and the Rocky Mountain region is getting their megafires pretty much annually, maybe it's time to look eastwards a bit and think about what region next should be taking notes so that they don't find themselves in that position completely unable to deal with fire. Um, I think that's going to be largely the Midwest where we have these huge forests that have not burned in a long, long time. So regardless, um, these fires burned, they had tons of beavers within them. Each one's a mega fire by size and by extreme fire behavior characteristics. And I went through and I asked myself like, okay, why are we even bothering putting numbers on this? We can see beaver complexes staying green. 
if you look at aerial images of beavers and their dams daily, like I do, you've already found them in this image. You're like, wow, that's a really cool beaver pond. Um, and if you don't, that's okay. They're much easier to find once the landscape burns. So this is what happened to these beaver com this beaver complex in Colorado after the mega fire came through. And what I used to really dig into this was something called DMBR. This is the differential normalized burn ratio that measures the burn severity at every single point in the landscape. And in doing this in these fires in Colorado, I was able to go through and figure out exactly how much of each type of spot in the landscape, places without beavers, but yes, in the rivers, places without beavers, but up on the hill slopes, or those places that beavers are damming in the rivers, how intensely are each of those spots burning? All in all, uh, I found that the non-river areas, so our hill slopes, only 40% of that is what's considered fire refugia, um, which would be unburned or low severity burning, generally beneficial for the landscape. 60% was moderate or high severity. We would have expected that to probably be somewhere closer to 10 to 20% uh, and in more of a mosaic, not just these huge clumps together. So that's not great burning. Um, that's not a great impact on the landscape. In fact, Colorado is still struggling to deal with the post-fire impacts of these three megafires three years out. Once we're in the rivers, which are theoretically very wet and hard to burn, unfortunately, the burn severity didn't look that different. It was about 50-50. So half of the area was fire refugia and half of the area was severely burned. Uh, that's too much, especially in the river. We expect most of our rivers to be fire refugia. It didn't happen. Beaver dammed areas were completely different though. 90-ish percent, 89% of those areas were fire refugia. They were reliably not burning. They were consistently not burning. And that is something that we can take advantage of even here in the Midwest. So I just talked a lot about fire. It doesn't feel like this is one of our problems, but it is. Uh, and we know that this works out here too. And maybe it's not entirely because of the water storage. A recent study that came out of Canada found that over 90% of fire resistant wetlands in Ontario's boreal shield were associated with beaver dams. So this has already been documented um, by a group I'm not even affiliated with up in Canada, finding that even here, even in boreal landscapes, even in soggy places and wetlands and marshes, they are fire resistant. And I'm just going to flick through some images to help convince you um, pretty quickly. These are some false color images and shortwave infrared images from the Greenwood fire, which burned in Minnesota, about 27,000 acres. Um, this was a pretty recent fire. In the false color, red means healthy vegetation, kind of a brownish color means burned vegetation. On the right hand side in Swear, green is healthy vegetation and then sort of brownish is burned vegetation. Here we are before the fire. I put some little white boxes around where I found some nice beaver ponds. After the fire, reminder of where those beaver ponds are, we're seeing them preserve that greenery. Here in Minnesota, this happened in the Greenwood fire. We had those wetland fire refugia created by beaver. And if you zoom in at this complex, you can see this is a pretty intense amount of beaver damming. These ones have taken over a dirt road, actually. So this isn't to say there aren't compromises to make with those beavers if we want these services, um, but they are reliable and they absolutely work in these landscapes here. Same thing happened with the Crooked Lake fire in Ontario. This one was a mega fire, 113,000 acres. Um, once again, false color on the left, we are on the right. Boxed in white now are a bunch of beaver ponds that I was able to find in these images. Burn the area, remind you of where those beavers are. And it's small and hard to see at this zoomed out scale, but going through and crunching these numbers, I am seeing the exact same patterns I saw before out west. It's the same story. Beavers create fire resistant patches in the landscape. And zooming in again, you can see these beavers are engineering areas beyond just their actual pond. They're changing whole patches of the landscape and that's what we want them to do. That's how we get these benefits. We can't just confine them to being a small dam in a small stream. You have to let them do their engineering at the wetland scale. And these patches are increasingly important. We are just beginning to understand all of the ways that having unburned patches in the landscape matter from ecology to water quality and other things. This is a really active area of research that I know will be important in the Midwest, um, just as it's been important in other parts of the country and the world as well. And if you're not convinced by those pictures, perhaps you're convinced by dollars. Uh, there is a cool study that came out a few years ago that estimated the total value of ecosystem engineering by beavers and this came in the form of things like I talked about the moderation of extreme events, floods, droughts, fires, et cetera, um, but also in greenhouse gas sequestration, water purification, water supply, hunting and fishing, um, 
I didn't even touch on those, but they're extremely popular activities at beaver ponds for good reason. It's great habitat for those animals. Biodiversity, nutrient cycling, historical value. There's a lot that goes into this. Um, it's $179,000 per square mile of beaver engineered habitat per year. So this is a continuing investment. The longer you leave beavers on the landscape, the more they have contributed to things that we care about that we would otherwise be having to pay human engineers to do. And there's a lot of buzz around this here, elsewhere. This is a conversation that can't be avoided. I'm really happy the summit is happening because as the issue of beavers and climate change continues to bubble up, we need people to be thinking about this and working with each other to make sure that we're focusing on solutions and not getting caught up in the weeds. So now what? What do you do with all this? I just gave you a ton of information and I have only just a couple of seconds left in my talk. Uh, should we just go ahead and start airdropping beavers across North America again? Uh, we did this. This is something to not take notes from the West on. Um, Idaho and California dro both dropped beavers out of airplanes with parachutes as a relocation effort. I don't recommend that. Uh, they say it worked, I'm skeptical of that data. Uh, but I'd say no, I think instead, I just wanna emphasize that we need to be collecting, analyzing and publishing data on this. If you look at the literature of just looking at beavers and fish, for example, when a paper says that beavers have a negative impact on fish, 72% of those statements are not backed by data or citations. They're just speculation. And when you see somebody say that beavers help with uh, increasing base flow during summer, about 50% of that time, there's not data associated with those kinds of statements. So both on the negative and on the positive, although noticeably more on the negative, uh, we are not backing up our statements with data. And we need to do that if we're gonna be managing beavers effectively and intelligently. And that means taking three-dimensional temperature maps, not just the surface temperature. What is the temperature where things like fish and frogs are actually living in the ponds? We need to be considering, are we in a drought state, a normal state, a winter, a summer? Is it floods? Is it fires? How are nutrients responding to all of the ways that beavers are changing the ecosystem? Is it doing denitrification? Is phosphate getting settled out? We've seen that happen in the East Coast. We've seen that happen in the Rockies. Are beavers a potential partner in dealing with algal blooms? Maybe, there's no data here on it. Um, we need to be doing this science and we need to be doing it in a controlled and in a careful way so that we are managing the species more sustainably going forwards than we have for the last 200 years. We also take tons of beavers out of the landscape and that's making a change. And this is something that's not being studied as well. So we're removing dams, we are removing beavers, we are using dynamite in some cases. Uh, what is this actually changing? We're also compromising with beavers. We are wrapping our trees in wires and fences to mixed effectiveness. We are putting in pond levelers, we're relocating beavers and changing where they are in the landscape and we don't know necessarily what that means. We talk about beaver damage on trees pretty commonly, but chewing trees is one of the key ways they build fire resilience. And so is it damage? Is it not damage? Does it depend on the context? If we wrap our trees, are we not gonna get fire resilience? Again, we don't know. So that's my take home message and that's my push. Um, we know that beavers do a lot of really valuable things for us, especially in the context of climate change, especially in the disasters that we've already realized as well as the disasters that are on their way to us now. We know that this is something that is repeatable and reliable, but we need more information on how this is usable in the Midwest context. The question isn't, are beavers gonna help us with droughts and floods and fires? The answer is yes, this is just a fundamental aspect of their engineering. The question is, what does that mean for us here? What does that look like here? So let's do that science, let's work in collaborative teams and let's answer those questions. Super quick shout out slide, I have to include it. I don't do this work alone. I work with lots of awesome students and lots of awesome funders, and I'm always looking for more collaborations. So definitely reach out if you have some science you wanna do with me or my team. And I think I have like one minute max maybe for questions, but I will definitely answer them in the chat if you have them. So thank you. Thank you so much, um, Emily. Yeah, unfortunately we are out of time for questions. However, um, for all the questions, we see a bunch trickling in. They will all get answered either now um, through Emily following up in the chat um, or there will be a message sent out. But we didn't want to cut off that wonderful, remarkable presentation um, that hopefully everyone was able to get something out of.